Uh, so tonight I just wanted to start with a bit of housekeeping. Uh, generally, when we're practicing this form in the Zendo, during the meditation period, you should be still. So that includes right up to the end of the meditation period. So when the bell sounds, it's still uh, we're still sitting. Until the clapper sound to mark the walking meditation period, we shouldn't be adjusting our posture or uh, uh, blowing our noses or anything like that. Uh, the Jiga Jitsu needs to say some things uh, so that the newcomers are familiar with the form and can follow along so that they know what's going on. And so our way of supporting each other in, in practice is just staying still in those periods uh, so that the people who need to do things can do them. Um, we're about to stand up, we're about to enter into walking meditation, so we can just hang on for the 30 seconds more uh, until we start, until we're able to move. Okay? Thank you. Um, tonight I wanted to talk about engaging with, engaging with practice or engaging with the form of Zen practice. Um, each of us, uh, as we approach practice, many of us find that <clears throat> um, as we uh, develop in our lives, as we mature as people, uh, starting from the time that we're very young, we are engaged in a process of more and more clearly defining this thing that we call I. From the time that we're children, uh, we're really encouraged to do this. What kind of a person are you? Do you like this or do you not like this? What kind of people do you like to hang around with? What kind of music do you like? What kind of art do you like? What kind of clothes do you like? Uh, each of us uh, creates this kind of combination of things, a uh, combination of likes and dislikes, of habits and patterns and preferences, and we sort of cobble them all together and we call them me. And we're encouraged by our parents and by our schools and by our culture and by our society, by our work. Encouraged to more and more clearly define that, to be more and more able to clearly describe that and explain that to other people. And as we continue to develop, sometimes we find that this clarity of definition, while it has its function, also uh, seems to do something else which isn't so fun, it isn't so desirable. The more we clearly define what it is in here, what it is that I am, we're simultaneously more and more clearly defining what we are not the things that we aren't, what we don't have. The more clearly we define what this is that's talking and looking out, the stronger, the, the more uh, palpable the separation between inside and outside becomes. And for many people, this separation, this um, distance between what's inside and what's outside, between me and you, between the self and our environment, our world, becomes uh, broader. It becomes uh, deeper. And over time, we can begin to feel more and more isolated, more and more alone. We can begin to feel more and more that we need something that's out there, that's not a part of me in how I've defined myself. In Buddhism, this uh, longing is called tanha, or craving. 
And the Buddha taught that this craving, which arises out of this separation between inside and outside, uh, is the source of all of our suffering as human beings. All the suffering in the world arises from this separation and the craving that arises from the separation. The good news is that this separation, this distance between what's inside and outside, it's just made up. It isn't real. From the time that we're very young, we conceptualize this separation, this distance. We describe it. We call it different names. We clarify its different qualities and we stick all of those qualities together and we believe it. We believe it with our whole body in spite of the fact that there is evidence to the contrary presenting itself all the time. Sometimes we can hear a beautiful piece of music and instantly that separation between inside and outside can spontaneously dissolve and we are immersed in the music. Where is I in that moment? Sometimes we can hear the sound of the wind or the waves or a bird singing. And in a moment, the self disappears. And we experience this fundamental unification, our true nature, we call it in uh, Zen. This is an experience of things as they are not as we think them to be, broken up into little discrete pieces, but things as they are as whole, one. Nothing inside, nothing outside, nothing to talk about or describe or criticize or complain, nowhere to go, nothing else to do. But after just a moment, again, we stick ourselves together and we say, oh, that was interesting. I don't know where I went. We do this when we laugh as well, when something's really funny. We forget ourselves and we are dissolved in the laughter. In the activity of laughing, in the activity of listening or singing or making art, In Zen, we say that we return home or return to the source or the origin, our true nature, Buddha nature. But this isn't something that that just has to happen sort of uh, accidentally sneak up behind you and whack you on the head with emptiness kind of thing. This is something that we can actively engage with in every aspect of our lives. And this is something that we're doing when we engage in Zen practice. We have this ritual form. And uh, Zen isn't a religion like uh, many other religions in which there is a holiness or some kind of specialness to certain things. All things in this vast cosmos are one. So what is it that we're doing when we're doing this ritual form? Each and every aspect of it, each and every bow, each and every interchange, each and every relationship between two practitioners is an opportunity for us to catch ourselves making this distance. So if I'm passing incense to another uh, officer in the Zendo, I can go through the motions of passing incense from one person to the other person, just do the job, just like I do everything else in my life. One blob that's separate from the other blob floating through this space of blob, bumping into each other as separate objects. 
Or I can take up the stick of incense and allow myself to become complete through the activity of meeting, of exchanging. In that single moment, allowing all of this character, all of these preferences and choices and ideas to dissolve in the activity of the breath. (sighs) To become one with the situation that I'm engaged in, the simple, simple activity of passing incense. When I'm walking, I can engage in walking in the same uh, worldly way that I do every day as I'm walking down the sidewalk. Just this individual person walking, walking away, and it just happens that there's a bunch of other individual people who are all walking kind of in the same direction at the same time as me. Or I can engage in this practice letting go of my fixation with this construct of myself. And I can allow myself to dissolve completely into the activity of walking. This whole cosmos, the whole world, this whole universe, unifying into the single activity of walking. And that practice, that opportunity, is a call or a welcome for me to return home to my true nature, to the origin. Each of these single, simple activities that we engage in in Zen practice, whether it's chanting or whether it's sitting, or whether it's walking, or ringing bells, or sounding boards, or doing clappers, serving tea. Each of these things can be done just doing the activity, just like we do everything else, completely affirming the separation between what I call myself and what it is that I'm meeting but we can't call it practicing Zen. We can take this same activity and by meeting it wholeheartedly with all of ourselves, surrendering everything, all of these constructs, all of these ideas and habits and preferences, allowing them to completely melt into this unfolding moment to meet it as not separate, to embrace it completely as myself, this whole world as myself, dissolving away, unifying, and arriving at my true home, the unfolding activity of this very moment. And if we're able to do this, even for a moment as we walk, or as we sit, or as we chant, or as we serve or receive tea. Then, as we arise again, as we come back into this body, we know, we experientially know for ourselves that this idea of self, this idea of me being a fixed, limited, uh, separate thing, is just an idea. We recognize our preferences and habits not as the truth, but as preferences and habits. And this simple experience of unification provides us with a powerful gift. And that gift is to be able to transform, to be able to change, Because we know for ourselves, we know through experience that we don't have to be this way. We don't have to like those things. We don't have to have this habit or that preference. When we see that our true nature is much bigger, when we see that our true nature encompasses all things in this vast cosmos, 
we realize that our potential is limitless. We realize that our capacity is boundless. We realize the vastness of our true home. <laughs>